Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest on our show today. This is Kelsey Gannett, and Kelsey has an amazing story to tell us, and she is a she was a retired professional athlete, and she had gone through a grieving process, an identity crisis, and she had overcome this issue, and she's here to talk about a lot of different important subjects, like finding your, your identity and going through the grief. How do you get over grief? You know, she has a lot of amazing things to teach us today. So I'm so excited because her her ideas and her views are just outstanding and her advice is going to blow you away. So Kelsey, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? I'm very excited to do this show with you. And I'm sure once the listeners start listening to you, they're going to be blown away just as I am. Hi, so my name is Kelsey Gannett, as you said. I am a current teacher based in Northern Virginia, and I also own and operate two different businesses. My first business is called 21 IELTS, and that is focused on in-person softball coaching with uh, young women who are aged from eight to about 21. And then my second business is the Retired Athlete Coach. The Retired Athlete Coach focuses on holding space for all individuals who are going through an identity crisis after they have retired from athletics. So this goes back into my experience of when I retired from collegiate athletics and really experienced a big identity crisis of not understanding who I was or what I wanted to do after I didn't have the goal of being the best athlete in, in my area. So I'm super excited to sit down and talk to you guys. I have a lot of experience about living with grief and processing through grief, and that is my jam. I know grief is sometimes a very unspoken about topic. So I'm really excited to peel back those layers and chat with everybody about my experience and how it apply, may apply to your life. So how did you feel to uh, go through, now you went through this amazing, you know, life and this college experience and you were, you know, living the life and all these great things were happening and life was grand. And then all of a sudden, you know, college is over, things happened. And then all of a sudden you were no longer the professional athlete. And it was like, okay, what now? So how did you feel like, how did you feel going from one extent to another extent? It was definitely a feeling of complete loss. So it kind of felt like the carpet had been ripped out from underneath me. So when you're um, specifically to softball, so I'm going to speak about softball, but this applies to many different athletic organizations. When you're a softball player, and I was a specialty player even further, so I pitched, this requires about 15 to 17 years of dedication to get to the level that I did. A statistic I read the other day said that 99.9% .9 of athletes that participate in, in high school sports will move on to college sports. So I was within that percentage and I felt so, it was the coolest thing for me. I was, absolutely loved it. Like it was, it was the most fun thing ever. Mm -hmm. And I really fell in love with the structure. I really fell in love with the coaching. I really fell in love with all of it. And my world became incredibly polarized around softball and you know as silly as it sounds that little yellow ball with the red seams controlled my life for probably about 21 years you know every day of my life I was constantly thinking about when was I going to lift when was I going to play when was I going to pitch what team was I going to look for what coaches did I need to email or anything else and so softball really became incredibly polarizing and I remember the moment that I realized that I would never play again and it was kind of silly because it was about a year later, I processed through my first season away and I had, you know, I'd been student teaching. I was out of the country, so I wasn't really exposed to it. I came back to my college town where I knew everyone through softball. I knew the entire staff through softball, you know, yeah. that uh, my college town knew me from what I did with my softball program. And so when I came back, it was a very warm welcome and everything was great. And I remember about halfway through my undergraduate or my graduate semester that I was spending there, I was sitting on my couch in my apartment all by myself. And I was like, you know, what would be so fun to burn off some steam is just go throw, just go throw a ball. And it was at this moment, I was sitting on my brown couch in my apartment and I realized, oh my God, I'm, I'll never touch that field again as a competitor. Yeah. Oh my God, I'll never... I'll never be able to st 
get like cheer and do all the fun stuff with my teammates. I'll never be able to do all this stuff. And it was kind of like this deluge of just like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? Like, how did I, how do I not have this? How is this not that? So in that moment, I really remember just feeling completely lost. And I remember vividly calling my mom because I'm from New York. We always call our moms. (laughs) Um, I'm calling my mom and saying to her, like, why do I feel like a piece of me is dying? Like, why do I feel like a part of me is just gone? And she was like, well, you know, it's totally normal for this to happen because you've experienced like this experience really was your whole life up until this point. Like, how can we help? What can we do? And she was incredibly supportive. But I just remember when I hung up that phone and sitting on that brown couch and just being like, oh my God, I never will be the same. Like, it just will never be the same. And so in that moment, I can really relate to, you know, everyone who's kind of going through that identity crisis, that moment where you just think, God, how did I get here? And how am I going to get out? And what's the next thing? I don't, and I think for me, because I was always a very forward thinker, I didn't know what was next. I knew I wanted to finish my graduate degree. I knew I wanted to do all those things, but I didn't know what goal I should have for the next thing. I didn't, no one was standing in front of me saying like, okay, so now you should do this next. And I think that moment where like, I realized, you know, not only are you really an adult at this point and you're out of college, yeah, but you're also, you don't have any goals that are linked to softball anymore. And that really was a, that was a brain, brain explosion moment. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, that, that's really hard because, you know, you put your whole heart and life into it. You, you have a, it's not just a, um, a lifestyle it's a community it's you yeah. you you bonded with a, a bunch of people you all have that one thing in common you're all you're all you're a team you're connected yeah. and then all of a sudden you know you have to get to a point where you have to move on in life and it's, it's you're taking the next step in life but then you have this great past and, you know, we could use it as memories and we can use it to strengthen us and we can use it, you know, for lots of different things. You know, we could take all those positive things that we got from it and apply it to our present. But sometimes you love it so much that it kind of, it's hard to let go. So yeah. you went through this first, it's like you went through two things. You went through the grieving process and then maybe we'll we'll talk about how you, you were able to kind of move forward out of the grieving process. Mm-hmm. But then I'd like to tap onto identity crisis because Mm -hmm. you're now entered a new life so it's like you know I know for me when as a as a mom when I Mm -hmm. when all my kids grew up and they like left and they started moving forward with their life it was the first time the house was empty and I was like even though I had a career and I had my life I felt like who am I you know because that part of my life was done It was complete. I did everything I needed to do. I raised those children and then boom, new life, new, Mm -hmm. new, you know, new, new present, new future. And then it's like, what do I do? Where do I Mm -hmm. start? So let's start with the grieving first. Like Mm -hmm. how were you, once you got back to your old town and you saw everybody and realization Mm -hmm. popped into your head and you're like, oh my God, I'm never going to throw that softball again in, you know, competition. I'm never going to be able to take those memories and actually Mm -hmm. relive them. Yeah. How did you deal with the grief you were feeling inside? Like, Mm -hmm. how did you connect with those emotions and how Mm -hmm. did you overcome those emotions? Mm -hmm. So I did a variety of things. Um, The first thing I did was I started actually talking about my grief and the grief that I was feeling. I um, spent the first year that when I had exited um, and I hadn't been in my town and all that stuff, I'd spent the first year kind of just pushing it off and being like, oh my God, thank God I'm not playing anymore. Like, this is so great. Like all this stuff. And there was kind of layers to this as well, right? Like I knew physically my body could have never done another year. I yeah. could have never achieved what I kind of ultimately wanted to. And that was a secondary kind of effect that kind of ha- played into the grieving process as well. Yeah. So I started talking and then I also started hanging out with um, people who would listen to me talk about it. Right. <laughs> and on top of that, I then also kind of started entering the fitness space. So I started going back to the gym and exclusively up until this point, I had only gone to the gym solely because of softball. I, and so walking into the gym 
as a person who just wanted to move their body and be able to like get past the sports injuries that I had kind of just, you know, pushed off and done all of these things. Yeah. Moving into the gym was a really, really good step for me because it allowed me to make some friends that were athletes, but they were lifelong athletes. They were athletes right. that were looking for mobility. They were athletes that were looking to, you know, do some CrossFit. They were athletes that were trying to make sure that they could run their marathons and do all of this stuff. So I kind of created a really cool community of athletes within the gym that I went to at my town and all of, almost all of them were retired athletes. So it was very interesting to see the dichotomy of the athletes who came back and were retired and never touched the gym. And then the other athletes that like me were going back into the gym. So I did a lot of that. And then I kind of, I went through a secondary thing. And that was that my life partner at the time had a life altering accident, which oh. caused him to be in a, um, a hospital for months and he's fine. Everything's great. Oh, but good. at that time we were really enmeshed. And so I had taken my, my focus and applied it kind of to our relationship rather than yeah. applying it to my grief. As we all do, we many times will focus on something else rather than dealing with our emotions. You know, we've all been there Yeah, myself out for anything, you know, but mm -hmm. so he had experienced his accident and we worked through his rehab and did everything else. And I had just gotten myself to a point where I was like, I've done it. I'm healed. I've realized what my goals are. My goals are really linked to this guy. Like, you know, everything's great. And he decided we, we shouldn't be together anymore. And so I had to then go through the process again. And at this point was when I realized I needed help. So I entered therapy for grief. And then I also started extensively journaling. And so I would write letters to myself in the past to honor those past memories. Yes. So I would write some weeks, I would write uh, letters to athlete Kelsey. Other times I would write letters to Kelsey who was in the relationship. And sometimes mm -hmm. I would just write anything that came into my brain because at this time, I was pretty isolated, living alone and being in a town pretty far away from my family. And I had friends, but they were all off kind of doing their own things. Right. And so I really needed to like have basic like conversations with myself. Yeah. And so at the end of every month, I would sit down and I would reread the letters and I would kind of sit there and I would say, okay, this is how you felt at this time this is completely valid. It's okay. And I would take those letters and I would put them in a box. And I found the box a couple of months ago and I actually still have it, but there, it's just my locked box. And it's not that I'm trying to push those memories to the side no. or anything else, mm -hmm. but my, I have a very active brain and having all of those words and those thoughts in my head the resentment for my ex, the everything else that kind of happened. Yeah. It really, the journaling, the writing and the letter writing is something that my clients for retired athlete coach do weekly. Yeah. And you can write it to your, whoever you're thinking about in the past. Cause we all have nostalgia, right? We all think about, you know, that ex, or we think about that time where we felt like we were at our best at our peak physically, mentally, or anything else. We all have those thoughts and those are completely normal. Yes. Where for me, my grief got tricky was when I would get stuck in the wanting of those things and knowing right. that they couldn't exist anymore. And yeah. so I spent a lot of time journaling, a lot of time talking and all of that. And that was basically year one of getting through my identity crisis. And so it is by no means the easy an easy thing, but it was definitely a hundred percent worth it. Um, after my ex decided we would not be together, I applied to a job, which actually led me to meet my husband about six months later. So, you know, I hate the saying that everything happens for a reason because I truly don't feel that you need to suffer in order to earn something. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, you know, divine timing is everything, whatever you believe in. And I think yeah. that that was, an incredible gift sent to me because I had done a lot of work to redefine myself and right. understand who I was. So it was really, it's a very interesting kind of turn of events, but it is something I'm really grateful for. 
I think that's so powerful. I, I personally love um, writing in journals. I, you know, it helped yeah. me throughout my obstacles in my life. And I feel like mm -hmm. just getting it out on paper sometimes helps with those repressed emotions. It like, yeah. it brings up emotions. And I think sometimes it makes a, a light bulb go off in you. And mm -hmm. then you realize, oh my God, you know, I, I'm feeling this way because X, Y, and Z, like mm -hmm. you, do, like you come to realizations about things that you never even realized beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like journaling is, is, is such a powerful tool. And I, I encourage people, you know, that, you know, haven't really tried it, you know, it's a great way to mm -hmm. overcome those emotions and those things in life. I, I think mm -hmm. that's so powerful. Yeah. I love it. It's my like favorite thing. My husband's always like, have you journaled today? And I'm like, no, that's probably why. Okay, let me go. <laughs> I set a 10 minute timer and I'm all good when I come back. And, you know, it's just something that like I, I've, like I said, I have a very active brain. So being able to put something somewhere where I don't have to, it doesn't have to ruminate in my head. It's yeah. my favorite thing. So I definitely recommend that. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And and how did you get over like, you know, part of the identity crisis? How did you find yourself and find the your next passion, your next thing in life? Like, how did you know this was it? Because people try different things and they go hopping and hopping and hopping mm -hmm. and they don't really know exactly what their passion mm -hmm. is. Did, did the light bulb go off or did something spark inside you? Or did you feel like you had some kind of, you know, spiritual direction? Like, how did you know what was the next part of your life? Like, when did it recur to you that this is what I want to do? This is who I am. This is where I need to be going in life. I think that was kind of uh, twofold. So it first happened, um, I met my husband at a sleepaway camp in the Pocono Mountains. I was mm -hmm. a camp counselor. And I think walking into that environment was just so freeing because nobody knew who I was. You know, I was a hometown girl when I did everything else. I had a lot of, I felt a lot of pressure to perform and be who everything. So kind of going where nobody knew my name was incredibly freeing for me. And yeah. it kind of allowed me to develop a passion for myself. Right. Up until this point had been devoted to softball or hobbies or other right. people. And so I think that was really, really important to me. And then the next thing that kind of happened was several years later, when I launched my um, softball coaching business, I was in a um, mastermind with someone who was helping me just figure out like LLCs and everything else and kind of what my next steps would be for my softball coaching business. And yeah. we were talking about, you know, identity crises and softball and everything else. Another um, girl in the mastermind was also a softball player. And she said, Hey, like, do you guys know what that's called? And I was like, no, I have no idea. She was like, it's a loose term from the metaphysical uh, community. It's actually called energetic death. And that's the exact moment that you realize that things will never be the same. And that's, you know, all of the identity crisis kind of yeah. meshed into it. And so when she kind of said that, I just literally remember like being like, oh my God, why doesn't anybody know about this? Why hasn't anybody told me? Why hasn't anybody sat down freshman collegiate athletes and been like, yeah. hey, I'm four years when this is all over, like this might happen to you and that's totally valid and okay. Cause we're all going yeah. through it at a certain point. So I think that was a really paramount moment to just kind of a little nudge from anyone kind of saying like, Hey, like this is really what you should be talking about. You're super passionate about it. Yeah. The air in a whole room about the grief you felt after an experience has come to an end. Yeah. So like, sit down and start talking about it. And so right. that's kind of, those are my two folds. Like this is your next step. I think it's really hard to say that because a lot of what my next steps are, are kind of put in my pathway. And yeah. I think, that, you know, hearing it from somebody else, it might be a little frustrating because you might be on the other side of this feeling like I just, I still don't know. I still don't know any of that. And what I would say to you in that is that, you know, little action is really, really important. So I made certain steps in order to get me to those places where the opportunities were in front of me. And so making and taking little steps where you're trying different things, I think is really, really important as well. 
I think you're so right. And I, I think, in, you know, the one thing I see in society is that everybody wants everything results right away. And, you know, it, people have to realize that even though you want results right away, that's not how it works, especially in the healing process, you know, and, and nothing is a one, two, three thing, you know, nothing that, that that's successful in life is one, two, three. And especially when it comes to healing the mind, the body and the soul, it takes time. And like you said, exactly baby steps it's yeah. it's you know day by day step yeah. by step and i feel like people need to be rewarded they have to reward themselves give themselves a little self love and, and self care and every time yeah. they do something good for themselves they should give themselves a little reward because, yeah. and, you know and that will kind of strengthen them to you yeah. know or encourage them to move forward how do you yeah. feel about that i really love that principle because like I've had people, I've had clients that I've worked with that have like really needed to compete again. And so I've been like, Hey, have you, this is going to sound really weird, but have you thought about playing candy crush? And like, <laughs> I like that. They're like, what? And I'm like, have you thought about playing candy crush? Cause you could crush some candy. You're not, you know, hurting yourself. Typically these are athletes who have retired yeah, yeah. From athletics because of a, a sport ending injury. Right. And so I'm like, Hey, have you thought about candy crush? Have you thought about playing call of duty? You know, I know that video games all have their place and everything like that, but like <laughs> those little baby steps of like feeling like, Oh yeah, I crushed that. Like, is yeah, yeah. Really you're into athletes. And then I always embed something in where I'm like, Hey, like, what could you do this week? That would be really exciting. Yeah. And, you know, athletes are boring when you say like oh I could go to the gym and I'm like that's not exciting like we don't that's not exciting like how what's actually exciting so with my last client that I worked with she really wanted to go to a hockey game and I was like let's go to a hockey game let's see what we can do and so like those little baby steps of finding and you know rewards are super important in the grief process because we're all chasing that dopamine that little bit of oh my gosh this is so I'm so glad I did this all of that and so yeah finding those little itty bitty things that you can have those moments are really really important so right I love that I you know I, I think it's so um important uh to people to have more people like you because I feel like you know grief and identity crisis is so prevalent in our society yeah. and so many people suffer from those two things for many different reasons mm -hmm. and I, I like how you took something that was really you know was a really big obstacle obstacle to overcome and you were able to turn it around and then you helped yourself and then you started to help others you know yeah. in the same situation so i think that is so you know the words are just like i don't even know what kind of words to use but it, it's 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 you know i give you kudos you know it's because it's you know it's so good you know you didn't let let it stop you from living you know you move forward and now you're helping others and you were mentioning that you're going to be doing coaching services you're going to be launching it very soon right mm -hmm. in the new year so can you tell us a little about that because I'm very excited to hear about it yeah so I am piloting I piloted last year a one-on-one -on -one coaching system for um under the umbrella of energetic death which I took and talked about at the beginning so Energetic death is the moment that you realize that your um, life will never be the same because an experience has come to an end. So I kind of break that down within three different things. The first and the biggest one is the identity crisis. Yeah. So when an experience comes to an end, you have to mourn that identity. And then that identity has uh, relationships. So, you know, you have relationships with coaches and everything else. And then you also have a bunch of other things that kind of fall within that. So you might have, um, you know, a lot of really good feelings about the place where you played or anything else like that. So that's kind of all embedded within my one-on-one -on -one program, which I'm launching at the end of January in 2024, which will cater to, I have spots for about three people mm -hmm. or um, specific grief and identity work. So within that is kind of a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. And then it also has, um, I always give you a little bit of homework. So I am still a teacher. <laughs> so just kind of keep that in mind. And I can't always assign my little middle schoolers homework, but you're grown. So you do get a little bit of homework. And that also has a um, telegram portion with it, which goes through Boxer. So you have access to me where I kind of just like get to talk to you and chat with you. So that 
uh, program will be found over at the energetic death coach.com and um, it will be within a whole banner and all that fun stuff. So I'm super excited about it. It's something I've been talking about for many years to the point where my whole family is like, please just watch this thing. We're so tired of you talking. About it. <laughs> but here we are. We're doing it messy and we're going to see how it goes. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And I have one question that popped in my head when you were talking. So when you were able to move on, you do have that group of people who get stuck in the past mm -hmm. and they just don't know how to let go. They like mm -hmm. live in the past, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, I always, I always love the saying the past is the past. We can't change the past. We have to yeah. focus on the present yeah. and then plan and move forward to the future. Yeah. But some people live in the past mm -hmm. and they don't know how to get out of the past. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice? advice for those people. And some people might not even realize they do it, but they're yeah. constantly, their conversations all have to do with the uh -huh. past and they yeah. can't let go of what happened mm -hmm. in the past. How, what do you suggest to those people who have, a, who struggle with letting go? I think for those people specifically, you know, you kind of need to have somebody hold up a mirror to you. So I'm going to be the person that holds up a mirror to you. You look great mm -hmm. and beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. But let's all just pause and think about that guy who literally cannot stop thinking talking about high school football. He played high school football about 20 years ago and he can't stop talking about the one times that he did, right? Yes. Those are the those are the people we're chatting about. And while you may have never played football, you may unfortunately be stuck with when your your kids still live with you, when you were married to someone, when you were with someone, when you did different things. And the time frame does not matter. Let me just go out there and tell you that. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if it was five years ago doesn't matter if it was yesterday doesn't matter if it was 30 years ago time frame doesn't matter we can right. still all really be stuck in that past and so for those people I would challenge them to take a moment and really just sit and think about what you are looking forward to because the, that will really define for people where their grief is and if they say like I've been in many times in many places where if you ask me this I would say well nothing my life is not what it was it's not you know I don't feel like I have anything forward yeah. and so for people who may say nothing what I would challenge them then to find is to number one find a pen and paper and write yourself a letter of the time frame you are talking about that you would be looking forward to if it happened again Mm -hmm. and see what comes up for that. And then from there, sit with that letter and kind of see if you can find something that you could look forward to that's embedded within that letter. So if I was in, you know, talking about when I grieved my athlete identity, I would write myself um, letters and be like, I can't believe that we didn't win the championship. And I wish that we did and like all this stuff. And so what I did the following year is I went and watched the team play at the championship and get farther than when I went. And mm -hmm. it was a really, really cool experience because I had paved the way and they were able to do it. And so I was able to kind of see it happening, but I yeah. wasn't a part of it. And you might think that might make you really, really sad. But I think for me, it was just like, kind of like, cool. It really is over. Like nobody's offering you a Jersey and being like, you know, screw the rules, get, yeah. get over here and get on and all that stuff. So you can't always do this, right? Like you can't always walk up to your ex-partner and be like, let's pretend we're together. So I can have this moment where it never happens again, right? Yeah, yeah. But you can really spend time and kind of reflect on what that would have looked like. And ultimately our timelines are never what we want. You know, I love when you said like, we all want it to be exactly the way we want it to be immediately. I'm one of those people. I immediately want, you know, the next step that I've decided or anything else. And so I think just kind of sitting and allowing yourself to understand mm -hmm. that there's no guidebook for it, but being stuck in the past does nothing for your future. And right. I think that's something that I wish that someone had told me for the first year when I was just in complete denial, yeah. it, it did nothing for me in the present. And mm -hmm. so, you know, stepping into that place is really, it's scary, but finding something to look forward to is so important. So that yeah. would be the, that would be the advice I would give. Now, if you had to take like everything that we talked about today and give, you know, kind of sum it up and try to give some really constructive tips to people, 
Mm -hmm. What kind of tips would you give people who are struggling with either identity crisis, falling into grief and kind of stuck in, in their own little era? You know, mm -hmm. what kind of advice would you give to people to kind of help themselves? Maybe some things they could do at home or maybe some eye openers were so to help them on their pathway of healing. What I would say to them is that they are 100% valid in grieving the experience that they are talking about. So if that's a time frame, if that's a relationship, if that's uh, when they were an athlete, if that's any of those things, I think, you know, giving yourself permission to grieve an experience is incredibly freeing. And it will also really help you start to understand what's changing. So yes. when you can kind of outline what you're sad about or what you're grieving, then you're able to outline like, okay, so I'm really upset that my ex and I are not together anymore. So that means now I need to get a new apartment. I need to get all of this stuff. And so that's really, really important is that acknowledgement that you can grieve that experience. Yeah. And I would also just say, you know, one day at a time is really important. And I know a lot of people probably come on and say this to everyone, but for me, I had to break all of this down into like very micro movements. Mm -hmm. So every time I got out of bed, check, win, I'm good. I did a great job. I'm so proud of myself. Yeah. I drove to Duncan and got a coffee. Oh my gosh, I'm killing it today. I left <laughs> my house. Like, yes. you know, so recognizing growth where you can and really having moments where you're really proud of yourself, but also acknowledging that this is not your forever, right? Right. I think a lot of us get stuck in the grief process because we want to feel all the feelings, which is incredibly valid. Yeah. But we get stuck in feeling that we're not done grieving. Yes. Right? And we'll never be done grieving. Right. Our heart just looks differently. And having that frame of reference and being able to say like, I'm never going to be done grieving that part of me that died when I lost softball. I'm really never going to be done with it. Right. But it looks different for me seven, eight years out than it did one year ago. And, you know, it looks different for me as a coach, the way I step on the field with so much gratitude than it did when I was a player, when there was an element of resentment. Right. right. So there's a lot of things in acknowledging that you will always have these feelings and being able to say like, this is not forever. I am yeah. going to one day I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to feel like I was sucker punched because I don't have softball. Right. One day I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to be so sad about my ex, you know, all those things. And just kind of having that, you don't know what it is and that's yeah. completely okay. But I think that's the time frame where everyone kind of gets stuck is because they don't acknowledge that you know, this is grief is forever, but it doesn't have to be feel forever. If that makes exactly. sense. So I think that's really an important frame of reference for when we talk about grief. Oh, I think those are amazing tips. I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find you? So if they want to go onto your website, where can they find you? Um, so my website is the energetic death .com. My social medias are my Instagram and my TikTok are the retired athlete coach. So I rebranded recently away from the energetic death coach because it was a little bit unaccessible for people. You right. Know, some people see death and immediately turned away and ran. Right. Um, and I totally got it because, you know, they didn't know that I was talking about grief and identity crises and all of that stuff. Yeah. So I rebranded on my socials, but I haven't put the money down to change my URL. So mm -hmm. you find me there. I'll be uh, smiling and all of that fun stuff. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I, I think what you're doing is great. I hope, you Thank know, you. we could have you back on the show. And, you know, you also mentioned that you have blogs and content also mm -hmm. for people. Is that on your website? Yes, that is on my website. And my TikTok has a lot more long form content. So I have about, um, I think it's three or four years of logged content. Oh, uh, wow. Talking about yeah, and you'll see the evolution of kind of where I came from and where I started, which I think is really, really cool. My Instagram was a secondary um, content form. So it's yeah. kind of neglected. It's on my list at my New Year's resolution to kind of get Instagram figured out. So if you come over on Instagram and follow me, I will I'll figure it out faster, you know. <laughs> 
You heard everybody. You need to follow Kelsey on our Instagram and tell everybody your Instagram, your handle name again for everybody. The retired athlete coach. Yes. And that is also her TikTok name also. So yep. you can find her on both of them as the retired athlete coach. Mm -hmm. and one more time, tell everybody your website. So they just remember, they don't forget. The energetic death coach. And remember, we're going to have all that in her description. So you can find all the information will be in the description mm -hmm. box and any comments that you want to leave her, you could leave in the comment box and we'll be happy to give them to her also. So, you know, I hope you can come back on the show because I really love to tap in and go a little deeper into some of the topics she talks about, because I feel like they're so important. They really need to, we need to like delve a little deeper, you know, because I feel like, you know, there are so many things and so many issues that we could go into into that will be so beneficial for people to help them grow, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually, because it all ties into one. So I hope we could have you back on the show. This has been an amazing event. And I'm so thankful that you came on the show. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Thank you so much for having me. This was lovely. Oh, thank you. You have a great day. You too.